As we studied this morning the works in the Bible, that that becomes, when you get into a Bible discussion on works with denominationalists, it's like waving a red flag in front of a charging bull because it's almost a dirty word for them. They hold basically to a no works salvation. We looked at uh, a few or three works that are found in the Bible this morning. The first that we noted, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, works for making a living. That it is right that God created us to work in that regard, to labor with our hands. And the person who refuses to do so, uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians to let him starve to death. <clears throat> then there's works of the devil. And we see that in 1 John 3 and verse 8. Uh, and those works would be, of course, sin. He tempts man by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, which we are not to love, but we are to have the love of the Father instead. He tempted Eve in that way, or in those ways. She, of course, succumbed to sin. He tempted Jesus in the same way. Jesus overcame that sin by God's word and having it hid within his heart. He's going to tempt us in that way as well. And if we succumb to his ways, then ultimately it will be the destruction of our souls in an eternal torment. We also noted the works of the flesh is another work that's found in the Bible. Galatians 5th chapter verses 19 through 21. These works are inherently sinful themselves and thus must be avoided at all costs because those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, as Paul puts it in verse uh, 21. But then also there are the works of man. Now, when we're talking about the works of man, this is mainly man's attempt to achieve salvation through their own teachings and own efforts. <clears throat> we see this in Titus, the third chapter and verse 5. When Paul would say, not of, by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The works, <coughs> the works of righteousness, that would be righteousness, is that which puts us into a right relationship with God and with others. So works of righteousness, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, that we devise, that we try to accomplish so through our effort to put us in our, a right relationship with God. And Paul says, it's not according to that. In writing to the Romans, Paul would write in Romans 10th chapter, and he's already expressed his great desire for the Israelites to be saved. And he goes and he tells in ninth chapter a great deal of their background, and that uh, advantage, the advantages that they had. But then in the 10th chapter, he tells them, For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now here's a perfect illustration that Paul is using of man trying to accomplish his own salvation. Because here's these individuals, a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. 
zeal for God is important. We should have a zeal for God. But it must be according to knowledge. Knowledge without zeal is pretty worthless as well. It takes both of them, zeal and knowledge. But the Israelites were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were ignorant of that plan, that way in which God has set forth to save them. They were ignorant of that. And so what did they do? They went over here to another way and tried to set up their own way of saving themselves. And through that way, they thought that they could be saved and that they would be in a right relationship with God. But Paul says, because they've done this and not this, which God said, they've never really submitted themselves to God. Without submission to God, we cannot be saved. They were doing their own thing instead of submitting to God. Possibly any, uh, a possible illustration of this would be in Ephesians 2, and this is always, it seems like, the passage that denominationalists run to. In verses 8 and verse 9 of Ephesians 2, when Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. <clears throat> I have, for all, uh, throughout the years, believed that this was discussing man's own works. The, this would be these that we're discussing, man's attempt to achieve salvation through their own teachings and their own effort. And he's saying, not of that type of works. That cannot save us. It would be, in a sense, excluding what, all that God has done for us. And through our own effort, we're going to save ourselves. That is the way in which I believe most in the denominational world would view this, along with, any. they would just say, any works. Most in the Lord's church, I think, would also hold that view. But there is another view that is a good possibility. And that is that it, this is discussing the works of the law of Moses. If you go on through the second chapter of Ephesians, you'll see that the main discussion is the works of the law or the law of Moses. Um, and us, those works would not be able to save, and we'll mention that in just a moment. And thus, it could be a reference to that instead. But if it is dealing with our attempt by our own effort to save ourselves and our own uh, teachings, our own effort, then no, it's not of that. That cannot save. What the denominational world does in looking at this passage, it's saying it excludes all works. All works are excluded. Because if you work, it's not of grace. And thus, it cannot, works cannot be included. But when you look at the works of man, <coughs> the denominational world literally is filled with the works of man in an attempt to save themselves. When they come along and teach salvation by grace alone, then they have excluded God's way of righteousness, and they've gone about to establish their own righteousness, their own method of saving people. The same thing could be said in salvation by faith only, that all you have to do is have faith, and at that moment of faith, you're saved. Well, again, they've excluded God's righteousness and what God has said on the subject, and they've gone about to establish their own righteousness, as Paul put it in regards to the Israelites, or saying the sinner's prayer. Whether it's put your hand on your heart and just, or 
just say this prayer and uh, you'll be saved. Well, that's man's devices, man's ways, but it's not God's ways. They are the ones in reality who teach a works of man salvation. But then there's the works of the law of Moses. And by the way, obviously those works of man, in that case, will not save anyone. The works of the law of Moses, though, these are works that the law of Moses demanded. Turn over to Romans 3rd chapter, and we'll start in verse 20 and go through verse 28. And Paul clearly starts this section by saying, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Well, that's pretty clear in relationship to the works of the law of Moses. By those deeds, by those works of the law of Moses, no one can be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the, <coughs> the righteousness of God without law, the law, is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all uh, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by the grace that through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Let's also tie in before we talk more about this, but in Galatians 2 and verse 16, Paul would write or state, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. There's that statement again, the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In both of these passages, Paul clearly, unequivocally states, we are not justified by the law. The law that he's talking about here, both in Romans and Galatians, is the law of Moses. The, Paul was addressing the Judaizing teachers and their false doctrine as he wrote both of these books. Galatians, he deals more with it in that book than he does Romans, but Romans also is, the background of it is those Judaizing teachers. The Judaizing teachers <coughs> were telling the Gentiles in particular, if you really want to be saved, what you've got to do is you've got to be circumcised and you must keep the law of Moses. Yes, you can become a Christian, but you also have to keep the law of Moses. Paul is showing that's not the case. The deeds of the work of the law, the law of Moses, and those works of the law of Moses will not save anyone. They cannot justify us. It is through the faith of Jesus Christ. 
And in Galatians, Paul goes on to show that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ so that we could be justified by faith, literally by the faith. And faith in both really Romans and Galatians is talking about that faith system. It is a system of faith in relationship to Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. If you notice in the Roman passage that we read that he's talking about that faith throughout the whole thing, uh, that we have faith in of Jesus Christ and to all that believe on him. There's no difference, he says, between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's the result? We have to be justified. How are we going to be justified? It's not by the deeds of the work of the law. That cannot justify anyone. That which is going to justify us is God. Now how is he going to do that? Because to be a just God, he has to punish the sinner. But he's also one who is a justifier. He is able to justify us through the sending of His Son to die upon the cross, to be a propitiation for us, to appease that punishment that was due us. We deserve death, Romans 6, 23, because sin, the wages of sin, is death. But here's Jesus being sent by the Father, to be a, an appeasement, a propitiation for those, that punishment that we deserved. But how? A propitiation through faith in His blood, the righteousness of the remission of, of sins. Now then, how does that come? Through faith, that system of faith. It's dealing with all of the New Testament concept as to salvation. It's not excluding any act. It's not excluding works itself. But it is excluding this that the Judaizing teachers were saying, you have to obey the works of the law of Moses to be saved. No, that couldn't save anyone. And Paul reveals in both Roman passage that we read and also in the book of Galatians that the law revealed sin unto us. But it could not take away sin. Not really. The blood of bulls and goats, the Hebrew letter states, cannot take away sin. And yet they had to, every year, go to Jerusalem and they had to offer the blood of bulls and goats but it could not take away their sin. That could only come through Jesus Christ, and thus that system of faith. Now then, during that Old Testament time, did they have to do those works? Absolutely. They had to be faithful to what God had commanded them to do. And so those works of the law of Moses were in effect at that time. But when Christ comes and his law goes into effect, then the works of the law of Moses are no longer in effect. They cannot save us. And so the New Testament goes along and teaches, for example, Hebrew, uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, <clears throat> even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's the law of Moses the ordinances of the law of Moses. And he said, he's abolished that, why? To make in himself of twain, both Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace. That's why I said, as we were looking at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the works that are there that he's talking about might very well be the works of the law of Moses. It fits within the context of what Paul is writing in Ephesians 2. That, that those works of the law of Moses could not save. 
and those works of the law of Moses were abolished. And we're now saved by the grace of God through faith. That faith system of Christ coming and dying for our sins. In Colossians, he also emphasizes this same idea of blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Well, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was the law of Moses because it revealed sin to us, but it could not take away the sin. Thus, it was against us. How are we going to have our sins taken away? It's by the blood of Jesus Christ in that faith system. And so when Christ comes and dies upon the cross, ascends back into heaven's home, and his law goes forth from Jerusalem, then that handwriting of ordinances was taken out of the way. It was no longer in effect. It was nailed to the cross. And that's what Romans 7th chapter also teaches. When Paul begins, Know ye not, brethren? And again, Romans being written with that background of the Judaizing teachers who are saying, You've got to keep the law of Moses. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law. What law? Well, he's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking to people who know that law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. But the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is freed from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man." Now that's an illustration of what he is dealing with in relationship to the law. The conclusion, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye are become dead to the law. What law? He's talking about the law of Moses. You become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even him that is raised from the dead. That's to Jesus Christ that we should bring forth fruit unto God. But some would say, oh, well, what law is he talking about? Well, skip down to verse 7, and we find what law he's talking about. When he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That law that said, Thou shalt not covet, is the law of Moses. It is specifically the Ten Commandments. The people, a lot of times, brethren even, want to say, is carried over into the New Testament times. No. But notice, Paul says, I had not known sin, except the law said. What was the law doing? It was revealing sin to man. But it could not take away that sin. Thus, the works of the law of Moses will save no one today. It cannot justify. But then... There are the works of God, or faith. The works of faith. Faith is something that is essential. In Romans 11th chapter and verse 6, Hebrews writer says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Impossible to please God without faith. That shows the essentiality of faith. In John the 8th chapter, in verse 24, Jesus says of himself, I say therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sin, <coughs> ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. 
So unless you believe that I am, Jesus says, and that I am statement is a statement that goes back and references when Moses was talking to God in the burning bush and he asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell them I am sent you. I am that I am. It is setting forth that he is one who has always existed, always will exist. And Jesus says, unless you believe that, you will die in your sins. Yet, Jesus teaches that faith, that faith that is essential, that we will die without, Jesus says that faith is a work. Turn over to John the 6th chapter. And these are the Jews who had sought out Jesus and Jesus is going to rebuke them and give them a rather sound thrashing along with it's so, such a strenuous teaching that they leave him never to return. But during this, they said, and they asked Jesus, verse 28, they say unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, if all works were excluded, wouldn't this be the perfect time for Jesus to tell them, you cannot do any works. Those works are excluded. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus' response to this, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus' response this is the work of God, that ye believe, the term believe is the same word as faith, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now Jesus had said, John 8 and verse 24, unless ye, well, ye shall die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Now then he's saying, this is the work of God that you must do. What is it? Believe, have faith, in the one that God has sent. That's Jesus. You believe that I am. Now, that is work. That's the work of God, Jesus says. Now then, when you start going through the scriptures, faith and work in reality go together. For example, in Galatians 5th chapter and verse 6. <clears throat> he says, For in Christ Je or Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. <coughs> the circumcision, of course, would be the Jews. Uncircumcision, being Gentiles, means nothing. What does mean something? What does avail? Faith which worketh by love. That's what avails, Jesus says, or that Paul says, faith working. A working faith. And he, says, he includes by love. That's what avails today. Yet we're being told by the, by the denominational world, all works are excluded. Yet Paul says it's a faith that works by love. He basically repeats the idea in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. When he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Notice a work of faith. What must we do that we can work the works of God? 
believe on him whom they have sent. Here is the work of faith. But he also adds labor. Labor is the same thing as work. Two terms are synonymous. A work of love. That would certainly include a love for God, a love for our fellow man, a love for the truth of God's Word. And then we have patience of hope. Turn over to James, the second chapter. <clears throat> And in verses 14 through verse 26, we see a discussion of faith and works. And James writes, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save Literally, it's can that faith save him? It's not can faith save him. It is can that faith save him. What faith? A faith that does not have works. Can that faith save him? And the answer is, of course, no, it cannot. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful for the body, what doth it profit? That's an illustration of what he's teaching now. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So here's faith without works. It's the same thing as that individual who comes and he's naked, destitute of food. And all you say is, be warmed and filled. And you don't give him anything. What does it profit that individual? What profit is there if you have faith without works? It's dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You can't show faith without works but I can show you my faith by the works that I do. Thou believest there is one God. Literally, that's, you believe that God is one. Thou doest well. The demons also believe and tremble. So even the demons believe that God is, that God is one. And if you go back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, notice the times as you read that, how many times the demons will proclaim Jesus as being the Christ, the Son of God. The demons even believe and tremble. Does it save them? No, it doesn't. But wilt thou know, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not, our, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? <clears throat> Seest thou how faith, <coughs> faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So without works, faith is dead. It will not save. James uses two illustrations of works that justify. In talking to denominational people, they want to center upon Abraham. And if you have a timeline and set up a timeline in this regard, Abraham, being a, <coughs> being a Jew, 
they would say, is thus one who is a child of God. And thus one who is a child of God is justified by works. They have to do works. Who? That one who has been justified by his faith only. He's saved by his faith only, and that's Abraham. Abraham was saved, and then he did his, his works in offering up his son, and thus, because of that, he is called a friend of God, and it is imputed unto him for righteousness. When? That was long after he was a friend of God, though. He was the friend of God first, and then he did his works. And so we're saved, the denominational argument, we are saved by faith only, and then after that faith only saves us, we as then a Christian have to work. Now, and if you go back, just a real quick reference to Ephesians 2, we read verses 8 and verse 9, For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice now, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What is it? That faith alone saves us, and then after being saved, we are created in Christ Jesus unto the good works. So the works come after the salvation. Now, and that's the way in which they would argue. There's, they would argue that Abraham thus is an illustration of one who is a Christian, one who is all, has become a Christian by faith only, being justified by works. There's a couple of problems with that, to say the least. If you look back at Abraham's life, there are certain things which their timeline in that omits. We are really introduced to Abraham back in Genesis 12th chapter and actually the few verses before the 12th chapter and the 11th chapter where he leaves Ur the Chaldees and he goes to Tira, and then later on he comes down into the promised land. Why did he leave Ur of the Chaldees? Because God told him to. What was it? He was obedient. But that is before he is called a friend of God. He was obedient first. What did he do? Those are labors. He did his labor before he then was called a friend of God. He is called the friend of God based upon the promise that through thy seed, not uh, Ishmael, but through Isaac, shall thy seed be called. And he believed God, it said, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Later on, when he had had his son, God says, go offer him as a sacrifice. And he obeyed. Thus, you have obedience. You have him becoming the friend of God by his belief. And then you have obedience. They omit that first obedience, though. But also, when God told him that in Isaac your seed's going to be called. Not through Ishmael, but through Isaac, the seed that you're going to have, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And it says that Abraham believed God. What obedience was there to take place in relationship to that promise? There was none. There was no command that God gave to Abraham at that time. He had before, he did after. 
But at that time, when it states that he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, there was no command in relationship to the promise that was made him. The commands had come before, the commands had come after. But at that point, all that Abraham could do was believe in what God told him. Thus, their argument that Abraham illustrates one who is already a Christian who then works simply does not hold in relationship to the life of Abraham. But there's another problem because there's another illustration here. Abraham isn't the only illustration that James uses. He uses Rahab. Well, who was Rahab? A harlot who lived in Jericho, was not even an Israelite. If you want to make that comparison that they are wanting to make, she's not even a child of God. She is a Gentile, one separated from God. And yet, James uses her, Rahab, was justified by works. She later became and was a part of the Israelite nation, but that would show her works were before her becoming a child of God. And so whichever way you want to have it, if Abraham shows that one who is a Christian has to work, Rahab shows that one has to work in order to become a Christian. Otherwise, the illustrations make no sense. Let's move on. Next, 10th chapter, verse 34 and 35, and try to hurry through these last couple of passages. Peter comes to Cornelius, opens his mouth, and said, Of a truth I believe. Uh, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. If we want to be accepted with God, we must work righteousness. Now what is righteousness? Righteousness, now it has been revealed in the gospel, But righteousness, its basic meaning, is being in a right relationship. When we're talking about our relationship with God, it would thus be in a right relationship with God. Accepted with God. The last statement there in verse 35. And to be accepted with God, we must work righteousness. That righteousness is all of God's commands. 119th Psalm in verse 172 says, My tongue shall speak of of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And then in Romans 1, 16 and 17, that gospel of Jesus Christ reveals the righteousness of God. So if we want to be in that righteous, righteous state, that right state with God, accepted with Him, we must work all of God's commands. We must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus it's no wonder Paul would state, Philippians 2 and verse 12, Wherefore, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying your own devices your own way of saving. He is stating, you work out your salvation. How? By your obedience to all of the commands of God. By your obedience to the gospel. While there are some works, yes, that are condemned in the Bible, there are some works that are approved of Him and some that God has mandated that we must do to have the salvation of our soul. Let's never denigrate the necessity for works. 
because they are included in God's plan of saving sinful mankind. Now, if you're not a, a Christian this afternoon, through your faith, repent of your sins, make a confession of your faith, let us baptize you in water. If you need to repent because as a child of God, you've gone back into the ways of the world and you brought reproach upon the name of Christ and upon the church, and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can have that eternal salvation when Christ comes again. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.